Thank you. In the beginning, there was darkness, darker than the blackest night. Can you hear me now? Hello? Hello? Okay. Really close. Okay. All right. So in the beginning, there was darkness. And it was really cold, a few degrees above absolute zero. We icy dust particles were sitting there shivering in the cold as the turbulent winds pushed us here and there. We consoled ourselves by saying, well, a few hundred thousand years ago, it was even worse. The winds were supersonic. Now they're at least subsonic. Gradually, the word reached us that there was something outside and that the dust outside us was blocking the light from outside. And we were in a big ball of gas and dust. And the great god gravity came by and saw this ball of gas and dust and said, I can do something interesting with this. I can make light out of darkness. And the great god gravity started squeezing this ball of gas and dust, first on the inside, then farther out. And we began to feel something we'd never felt before. We experienced falling. Before that, every direction was the same. But now there was a down, and it was down that we were falling. At this point, Lord J came along. And Lord J said, great god gravity, you can make it fall in, but only I can make it spin. And spin we did faster and faster as we fell toward the center. And the dust particles near the center got evaporated and fell into a ball of gas at the center. And they became the protostar. And the great god gravity said, this is good, but something is missing. The dust particles a little farther out lost their ice. They were too close to the protostar that was warming them up. But they began to stick together because Lord Maxwell was called on. And Lord Maxwell called upon his banners, Lord Vandervals. Lord Vandervals made the dust particles sticky. And the sticky particles began to stick together and make bigger dust particles and bigger dust particles and pebbles and rocks. And then these rocks began to collide with each other. And at this point, the great god gravity said, I can take over again. And the great god gravity pulled these particles toward each other, making collisions of big things to make planetesimals, and ultimately collisions of the planetesimals to make planets. Now, we were further out. My group of icy dust particles stayed on the outside, so we kept our ice. And in fact, as the protostar got dimmer and dimmer, it got cooler and cooler again. And we collected more ice as time went on. We began to grow into bigger ice things. And those ice things came together and grew and essentially became icy bodies, things like comets. And occasionally, we would make something big enough that it looked like a snowman. But you know, the, the, uh, the great god gravity and Lord J and Lord Maxwell, who had made us stick together, said, you know, this is getting cold again. We got to do something. This protostar is getting fainter and fainter. We need to do something else. And so the great god gravity went into the center of this ball of gas at the center of the disk and squeezed and squeezed until it became really hot and really dense. And then she called upon the, the lords of the nuclear lords, Lord Strong with his tricolored flag and Lord Weak with his flavor flipping powers. And they and Lord Weak began changing quarks, flipping quarks, and changing protons into neutrons and deuterons, pro protons into neutrons, 
hydrogen into deuterons, deuterium into helium-3, and helium-3 into helium-4. And this went on and on, and it became the source of fusion, which powered the star and made it a stable star. And the physics lords said, behold, it is good, and we shall call this the sun. And the great god gravity said, behold, it is good, but there's something missing. And they remembered that these icy dust particles were in the outer part of the disk. So they called upon Lord Maxwell, and he called upon his chemical gods, his chemical lords, van der Waals, hydrogen bonding, photo reactions, and we got more complex. We were still icy, but we had now things like amino acids and other medium-sized molecules stuck in all that water ice. And we got more and more complex, and then the great god gravity said, Okay, now it's my turn again. And she introduced an orbital perturbation, which sent us flying into the inner part of the solar system, where we crashed into a waterless rocky planet, not that rocky planet, <laughs> and we called it Earth. So we crashed into this rocky planet, and many, many comets and icy bodies crashed into this rocky planet, until we had an ocean. And in this ocean, all these molecules that we had brought were collecting, we were reacting, changing our form, trying different combinations, and the great god gravity and the physics lords said, well, this is interesting. Let's let this go on for a while and see what happens. And they went off. Well, first they said, you know, this ocean kind of looks like what people call the primordial soup. And they said, well, the primordial soup is fine, but it's going to take a while. So let's go make some more stars. That was fun. And they went off and made some more suns that became the stars in the sky of the Earth. And in the meantime, we worked and changed and tried lots of combinations. We came apart, went back together again, until eventually an informational self-replicating molecule arose. And the physics lord said, oh, this is great. Lord Darwin, we leave the rest to you. And Lord Darwin called upon his banners, mutation and natural selection, and they went to work. And eventually, this macromolecule became nucleic acid. And the nucleic acid was able to make protein. Now, my clan, meanwhile, carbon-rich, had become lipids. And we combined with some of these proteins to make a membrane and surrounded the nucleic acid and the amino acids and, and proteins to make the first cell. Now, the cell had the amazing feature that it could duplicate itself. So through the process of mitosis, this cell could share, could copy its nucleic acids, separate them, and then we, the membranes, could make a little division between these two parts and make two cells. And they were identical. They were clones. And so the great god gravity and the physics lords returned from making stars and took a look. And they said, wow, Lord Darwin, you've made an amazing tree of all these microorganisms. There's microorganisms that can survive in extreme cold, extreme heat, hot acid, extreme salt, live in the rocks, live in the air. This is amazing. But you know, we were thinking about something bigger. And so Lord Darwin said, OK, mutation, you've got to come up with something new. And mutation came up with meiosis. In meiosis, each of these final cells has only half the genetic material. So they need to combine with another cell, with another half, to make a complete cell. And all of a sudden, there was sex. And with sex, there was death. We lipids, on the other hand, were still immortal. We just keep adding to ourselves, and we've been around since the beginning. So we kept going, but once we had, once we had male and female, there was death. Now, 
natural selection really had a lot to work with. It didn't need a new mutation every generation. It just worked on all this variation that came from combining male and female. And so it began to produce a bigger and vaster array of kinds of organisms, creating tissues and organs and neurons, with Lord Maxwell crackling electricity along these neurons and neurotransmitters communicating between neurons. And we built, built more and more complex organisms. So we had a, a tree of life that looked like this, still mostly microorganisms, but there's a little section over there, which is big things. And we're on one of those little tiny stubs there. So now we had big things. This took about two and a half billion years. And the great god gravity and the physics lords returned to take a look. And they said, OK, this is looking promising. What else can you do? And natural selection produced all the fishes in the sea. And some of the fishes came onto land part of the time and became amphibians. And some of the amphibians found they no longer had to go back to the water and became reptiles. And some of the reptiles turned into mammals who bear their young alive, and care for them. And the great god gravity and the physics lords returned from making supermassive black holes and things like that to see what was going on on the Earth. And they said, well, these biology lords take a really long time to do something. But they make pretty complex things, much more complex than we can do. So this is good. And look, there's some funny two-legged animals with big heads. Let's come back in a while and see if they can figure out how they got here. And that's our story for tonight. All right, thank you. We have time for some questions. So, if you so the way this will work is if you have a question, raise your hand. I will call on you. You can ask your question. Hopefully, one of us will remember to repeat the question, and then Neil will answer it. So, any questions to start off? How about right here in the front? So, the space between stars, which we call the interstellar medium. Oh, sorry. He asked what was the cause of the winds that I talked about. I was using the term a little bit loosely, but basically the interstellar medium is full of turbulence. So if you imagine like when a cold front comes in and you're trying to walk uh, through a bunch of buildings, you'll feel these winds stirring around. It's like that, except that most of the space is filled with a supersonic turbulence. I mean, imagine going faster than, you know, than sound and dealing with that kind of turbulence. So relatively speaking, we talk about these regions that form stars as being low turbulence, but they're still pretty turbulent. Yeah. All right, another question. Um, someone had their hand up and then put it down. All right, how about here up front? The ultimate, so what is the cause of the turbulence? The ultimate cause of the turbulence is that after you make a star, particularly a massive star. The massive star will do a lot of damage to the surroundings. It will send out winds. And then at the end of its life, a massive star may actually blow up as a supernova explosion. And that sends out gas at tens of thousands of kilometers per second. And that stirs up the entire space in our galaxy between stars. So, so that turbulence ultimately derives from the explosions of stars and, and, and massive stars sending out material. All right, we'll come back to you if you have a follow-up. How about you? OK, so Lord Maxwell called upon his banner man, Lord Van der Waals. Van der Waals is a, is a force from electricity and magnetism with molecules that will attract each other from a long distance. So, so if I have two molecules, basically, they don't have much attraction. But because they can slightly affect the electron clouds of the other molecule, they will cause a general attraction. 
Uh, all right, we have more questions than we have time for. We'll start here. So yeah, how long did all of this take, everything I talked about? Because the point is the galaxy is 13.7, or the universe is 13.7 billion years old, and the Earth's 4.4 4 and a half billion years old. So the ancient scribes disagree on this particular topic, but um, essentially uh, our work suggests that from the beginning when you have one of these clouds of gas and dust and it's ready to collapse, the whole process to having um, stars and uh, planets around them takes a few million years. Yeah, only a few million. Yeah. Um, all right, let's do you up front. So I got the idea for this uh, while I was on a cruise, <laughs> lis listening to uh, blues and, and uh, rockabilly. And uh, they had the McCrary sisters, and they're a gr group singing gospel. And somehow that put me in the mind of Genesis, and I, my mind wandered, and I started thinking, I'm going to tell the story of creation, but with a scientific point of view. So that's the McCrary sisters. <laughs> All right, we'll do one more question, and then we'll have to move on. So. so that's Lord J. Now, J stands for angular momentum. It's a symbol that we use for angular momentum. So I call him Lord J. And basically, if you start this ball of gas and dust with even the slightest amount of rotation, it's going to be amplified because of the conservation of angular momentum. So in fact, we have to do something about that, which I left out of this story, because it's magnetic fields, and none of us like to deal with magnetic fields. But essentially, if you start with this thing with a tiny amount of rotation and you conserve all that angular momentum, all that J, you would wind up with a star spinning faster than the speed of light, which is clearly impossible. So Mr. B, who is part of Maxwell's work, helps the, fights a little bit against the Dr. J, and they, uh, they wind up with things spinning somewhat, but not so fast. Sorry about that. <laughs> In this mythology, though, where is the uh, ice-breathing dragon from the north that is flying in? <laughs> well, what direction is north? <laughs> Fair. Well played. <laughs> All right, let's hear it again for Dr. Neil Evans.